Well, good afternoon, everyone. You, you heard several times about the natural gas and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then tight oil energy revolution, which uh, we are all the beneficiaries of, and yet we find ourselves in a period of remarkable uh, downturn in the oil and gas sector. So we've used innovation very effectively, as you heard this morning, to uh, create an abundance of, of fossil fuels. You know, it was only 10 years ago that people were talking about peak, peak oil, and we were running out of of fossil fuels, and, and now the situation is, is very different. And innovation had a lot to do with that. But where we are today is uh, equally dependent on innovation and how we go into the future, and that's what this, that's what this panel is all about. Uh, Carl has introduced the panel to you. Uh, there are more lengthy uh, biographies uh, in the program. So uh, what I'd like to do is just get right to it. I'm gonna ask each panelist a question and then give them uh, a chance to reflect on what the others say, and then we'll have some questions at the end and some general comments uh, for all of them. So uh, let's start with uh, Doug Suttles. And, and since innovation has gotten us to where we are, what do you see the role of innovation being in sort of getting us you know, even further into the future and, and, and achieving even more in the future than we have in the past? Well, Mark, you know, the, um, the, the track record in the data is pretty compelling in our industry for the role of innovation. I mean, our industry is actually pretty good at continuous improvement in finding ways to get these uh, small uh, efficiency gains all the time. But if you look at its history and whether that's opening up new resources or just getting at those resources at lower cost, the big step changes have always been driven by innovation. Now, the one we've seen with, uh, with shale oil or unconventional oil and gas over the last decade is probably the most remarkable we've probably ever seen in a in a tight time span. And what's interesting is today with $35 oil and, and $2 natural gas, which a lot of people in this room probably really love, I'm that guy when I go to the pump and it isn't 100 bucks to fill up the car, I'm depressed. Um, <laughs> but, but it's even more important now. It's, it's absolutely critical because actually for us, unfortunately, we can't set the price of our product. We only control the cost. That's the only thing we actually control. And innovation's a core driver in this. And, uh, in our company this year, um, or last year, it feels like forever ago, but last year as the price was falling and, it, and, and we kind of forget, you know, the oil price had a nine on it um, at the end of October, early November, and by the middle of January last year, it had a three on it. It actually recovered a bit, but it was in the, in the $30 range. We were so worried that our organization would stop focusing on innovation, that their natural instincts would be, it's a tough time, I've got to get really conservative, I've got to make sure I don't... I don't try anything new because something might go wrong. And they'd stop that. And we were so convinced that innovation would be the key to succeeding through this down cycle. We brought the top 40 together to only talk about that. How do we make sure we don't stop innovating? And, and if you saw John Christman's piece, he talked about it. We, all of us up here could probably talk about it. The rate of improvement last year was incredible in the industry. Uh, and the odd thing is the consumer wins off the back of it. Uh, we, we, we fight like crazy to, to find better ways to do things. And, and maybe the, the last comment I'd make here is North America is really unique in this industry. And I've worked all over the world. I've worked in every part of the planet that produces oil and gas. And we have over 5,000 oil and gas companies here who are constantly trying to figure out how to do things better than, than their competitors. And so if Susan and her company figure out a better way to do something, the only dumb thing I could do is not copy it. And I use this phrase in the company that plagiarism is something you get punished for in school and you get promoted for at work. Uh, uh, the students should remember the first part. <laughs> you know, you know, we, we, we face two challenges. You know, we're trying to get hydrocarbons out of rocks that are essentially impermeable by traditional standards. And so there's the production challenge. Um, and we've talked about horizontal drilling, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. There's the other challenge, uh, how we do this by lessening the environmental impact and the impact on the communities affected. And I think there's, um, you know, no better uh, example to talk about than, than one that's very uh, close to us here, and that's the DJ Basin, which is essentially adjacent to the uh, metropolitan uh, Denver area. And uh, Brad Holly is uh, uh, with Anadarko, and uh, they've, they've made some remarkable advances in uh, continuing to operate um, 
in the DJ Basin and, and by being better uh, environmental citizens. So can you tell us some of that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. You know, we feel like we're a better company by doing things safer and more efficiently reducing our footprint. So technology plays a key role in us being able to maximize production as well as being environmentally sensitive. And collaboration is really a hallmark of what we try to do. So we are out there listening. We really try to work with our peers and our service providers and the local communities, regulatory agencies, the stakeholders. And so that's been a big part of what Anadarko has done. But in the DJ Basin, as, as you mentioned, Mark, there's a million people that live along the Front Range there, and there's over 15,000 wells in the DJ Basin. It was a play where the vertical is a vertical program that came through decades ago. Now there's a horizontal program that's overlaid on that, which makes it unique, I think, of any of our North American unconventional plays. And uh, we've worked very hard to work in and among and around uh, those people. So Anadarko has invested about $9 billion in this play over the last nine years. Uh, we make about 240,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day and have over 6,000 wells. And so it's a major, major operation for Anadarko. And because we had a really long dated view and because we wanted to be environmentally conscious, we have gone to work to really innovate and really um, do things that we hope that will, will catch on, be industry leading and can be shared across other assets. Uh, one of the things that we did there was a water on demand system. And so we've laid over 150 miles of permanent underground uh, water lines, water distribution system in the field. Uh, and so all of our frack jobs now, pretty much 99 plus percent of them, get their water from underground. And so what we're trying to do there is take truck traffic off the road. Uh, we've eliminated over 10 million miles of uh, truck traffic and I think 2 million gallons of diesel. Um, and so it leaves the ro roads open for school buses and people trying to get to and from work. Uh, while we were doing that, um, when we had the right of way and we're laying the water lines, why not lay gas and oil lines as well? And so we have over 2,100 miles of oil lines and 1,300 miles of gas lines throughout the DJ Basin in our Wattenberg field. What that has allowed us to do is take 96% of the trucks that we were using off the road. And it's also allowed us to reduce our tankage by 82%. And so uh, we just don't need near as many tanks on location uh, because we have the underground transportation system now for all of our products. And so that's made a big difference in the Wattenberg field. I know that you know, but I'll remind you just the, the concepts of horizontal drilling and the concepts of locating in pads has reduced our surface prep by 90%. Because we don't have to have a vertical well everywhere that we're trying to access the formation. We can go horizontal and we can get there from a remote part. And so that's been really effective for the entire industry to go to pad drilling, horizontal uh, development. Uh, we've also developed a stem center, and we've effect we're effectively using this. And what it allows us to do is set all the hydraulic uh, stimulation equipment up on a common site that's hopefully remote and away from uh, the community. And we can actually remotely, we've done this up to a mile now, we will remotely uh, pump in the hydraulic frack job to wells that are closer to infrastructure. And what that allows us to do is build a smaller footprint for the well pad and it keeps the noise and the sound and the rumble of the frack tanks up to a mile away from our wells. And so that's been very successful. We have piloted electrical uh, drilling rigs and electric uh, frack uh, fleets. Both of those have limited, um, a limited ability to roll out uh, field wide, uh, but the tests were successful and uh, we're continuing to try to innovate and get that to a point um, that uh, we can use it. Anadarko is currently trying something really unique. Um, just this month, we have introduced oil to our central oil stabilization facility. We call it the COSIF. And what that is, is it, it's able to process 125,000 barrels of oil a day. There's two 250,000 barrel tanks, uh, which are the largest tanks we understand in Colorado. And what we've tried to do is centralize our oil gathering and be able to take off the flash gas and the natural gas liquids out of the oil at one spot. What that allows us to do is not have to do it at each individual pad. And so it takes the, uh, it reduces the emissions greatly and it allows us not to have to, uh, it reduces the equipment and the emissions as we take that off individual well pads throughout the field and concentrate that to just one spot. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is just the extraordinary data that uh, the industry has come up on and now collects. Um, millions and millions of bytes of data every day 
And we're taking all of that feed, all of the sensors on every well and every tank, we're taking that into an integrated operations center. And so we truly have a command center now in the DJ Basin. It's tied up with over 6,800 wells, and it has 3,700 tank battery sites in there, and they can remotely operate all the wells from that site. And it is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so all that data comes in, and we're actually able to watch and analyze and predict uh, without having to go out to site and actually see that. And what we found that that has done for the company is it's, it's reduced our downtime by about 75%. Because now if something goes down at 2 in the morning, we don't have an operator coming in at 6 the next day and finding out that the well went down overnight. Uh, we've got somebody that sees that. And because we know where everyone is in the field at all times, again, through automation systems, we can generally have somebody to site between 5 and 15 minutes. We've also seen like the local, um, it's been interesting, a side benefit that we didn't realize would happen out of this integrated operating system as we've seen local law enforcement and uh, people want to partner with us and come in because we have all of this on IMAPs and we can get in and we can see locations. We have cameras out part of the field. And so many times it's actually helped the community with law enforcement and, and that kind of thing. So um, just some things that uh, that was, this was not in place three to four years ago. And so I would just encourage that um, we have a industry and a company through, full of people that will innovate and will come up with great ideas if, they're allow, if you give them the goal and allow them to challenge themselves to get there. And the DJ Basin is a fundamentally different place to operate in 2015 than it was in 2012. And if we can get some regulatory certainty and be able to move forward, it'll be a fundamentally different place in 2018 than it is in 2015. Thanks. I, I think it's not unfair to say a few years ago uh, a company might have exploration and production over here and environmental health and safety over there, and they may not have always gotten along so well, but um, Susan Cunningham represents uh, the, an, a position that merges those, 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 those two jobs. So how, do, how does uh, Noble uh, use innovation uh, to address, you know, the upstream challenges uh, with respect to production and, and the need to uh, do a better job of environmental health and safety. Yeah, that's, that's great. It is a, an unusual combination. Um, what it's actually done is, is it's bringing more innovation and creativity to everything we're doing. Uh, we, uh, we believe that the whole system, is a, that the, everything is in an ecosystem and everything in the ecosystem has to thrive. So if you come from it from that perspective, then you're always looking for ways to to do something that will improve the system. So I'll give you an example, safety. Actually in 2015, we had record safety, recordable safety statistics as all these changes are going on. And it's because we engaged with the operations, we talked about how we really, we worked with the contractors a lot, and we really changed the conversation and how we innovate to be safe. And when you're safe, you actually have more reliable production, so it impacts production and reliability. That's just one example of the uh, kind of the unusual um, combination. But in this ecosystem, if everything is, 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 needs to thrive, then you're looking for those innovations all the time to improve in everything. And I loved what, what uh, Doug said about plagiarism. I mean, it's amazing when I hear about everything that we're all doing. We all know what we're all doing. Um, we all pick it up very quickly, which means we're innovating really, really rapidly because anything that works for one company, the other one sees, that makes a difference to that environment, to that culture, to those people, to efficiencies, all of those things, we take them from each other and, um, and improve the footprint, and, um, and it really makes a, a dramatic difference. Bart, you wanna tell us uh, about PDC's experience and how innovation has affected your company? Absolutely, um, thank you, Mark. Let me take a little different spin on this and, and maybe talk about how things have changed, um, how they can impact a business strategy, operations, and EHS. Um, PDC has been around 40 years and was founded in West Virginia. And the early business model of the company was to drill shallow Devonian wells. And uh, probably historically in the in the energy sector, that's probably the lowest technology development that's occurred in this country. Uh, the company quickly uh, migrated to the Rockies 
and had operations in the Piance Basin, uh, acquired some properties in the Wattenberg Field in the DJ Basin, uh, had operations in northern Michigan in the Antrim Shale. And that all led over the last 10 years with technological change to a really, really um, hard look at the strategy of where things are going. And through a series of different divestitures and, and acquisitions, we position the company around what we think are two of the better unconventional plays in the country. And we divested some of the assets that we felt maybe technically weren't going to align with where the country's going. So today, we have a major position in the Wattenberg Field and in the Utica Shale in Eastern Ohio. From an operational standpoint, let me start there and just talk about uh, how things have changed. Uh, and I'll, I'll refer to the, to the Wattenberg Field just to give everybody some points of reference uh, on the drilling side. Ten years ago, to drill a well uh, in the Wattenberg, and as Brad noted, uh, most of that development was vertical. It would take us about 10 days to drill a 7,500-foot vertical well. Today, we drill horizontal pad drilling primarily, and we can drill down 7,500 foot and also drill five to 10,000 foot horizontally. And we do that in about the same time that we drilled a vertical well 10 years ago. So how's that possible? It's possible through unbelievable upgrades, mechanical upgrades in the drilling rigs, uh, optimizations of fluid systems, downhole tools that uh, help, help uh, efficiently drill the well, and automation systems on our drilling rigs that uh, uh, not only make them incredibly safe, but also give, uh, uh, improve the rig efficiencies at incredible levels. And then the last piece of this is, our, is the IT side, the, the computer-based systems. Uh, what we do with the data on a drilling rig today, uh, how we gather it and get real-time data of what's going on in the drilling operations, gives us the ability to make quicker decisions and drill more efficiently. Let me talk about the completion side of our business. Uh, the pad drilling, uh, uh, let, let, me, let me jump back real quick on the pad drilling and just talk about uh, uh, what that does for uh, the environment. And Brad noted this, first and foremost is the pad drilling minimizes our land use. It gives us a centralized facility where we can go in and optimize not only the engineering, the emissions, but it gives us a very, very uh, great ability to, to optimize our operational efficiencies, which in the end gets passed on to the consumer because it lowers our cost to produce the wells. Now let me jump over to the completions. This has been a phenomenal journey uh, the last uh, 10, 15 years. Today, we move in, in a typical horizontal well, we will complete in one, uh, the, the amount of reservoir that we complete we can do that in one to three days. 10 years ago, that same amount of work probably was 20 to 30 days of work. And this is very important. We move one frack crew into a horizontal pad one time, complete all of the, uh, all the completion work is executed and that crew goes home. In the old days, we literally would take the crew, drive them to a vertical well, they go home, go to the second well, so we've eliminated our, eliminated our uh, 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 the, the fleet deployment into the field. Let me touch on EH&S a little bit. Um, and I think everybody knows Colorado is, is one of the most regulated, one of the most regulated states in Colorado, or in the country. Um, air quality is clearly leading this country. Um, we have technologies like infrared cameras right now that we use to monitor all emissions on every one of our locations. Um, we have, we have three-folded our eh &S staff in the last five years to keep up with the regulations. A lot of those employees execute higher technology innovation uh, concepts as we monitor and, and abide by the regulations. And again, these infrared cameras are, are something that we've been doing for about four or five years. It's commonplace now in the Wattenberg field, and it's becoming commonplace across the country. And they basically, basically tell you if, if you have what they call a VOC, or a volatile organic compound leak. If there's a leak, we have another whole crew that comes in and fixes a leak. This is all an effort to try to control methane emissions in our operations. 
Um, la last, just to touch on, um, that uh, it was three years ago. Uh, for those who were in Colorado, we had uh, a pretty significant event, and actual, it was actually classified as a thousand year flood. And I think all of us who operate in the Wattenberg or anywhere near the Platte River coming out of Denver learned uh, Mother Nature can be vicious at times. And that, that spurred us to change, uh, dramatically change our construction practices in the floodplains. And so we've applied a lot of new technologies to protect those locations from having another flood. So Mark, I think Good. that's... Thank you. I, I want to ask two follow-up questions about sort of the recovery of unconventional hydrocarbons and two related to environmental issues. Uh, the one with respect to environmental issues, uh, everyone, because you have a common experience uh, in the DJ Basin, talked about all you did with respect to lowering the impact of operations on the people affected. But as you stand back and look at, say, natural gas, one of the issues that comes up over and over again is methane leakage. And it's, it's argued uh, uh, that by, by some, taking what you know, many of us think are rather extreme and unjustified positions that the methane leakage problem is so bad it obviates the benefits of, of fuel switching, uh, say from coal to natural gas, and uh, undermines a, a lot of the uh, uh, the arguments why fuel switching uh, is an important you know thing to do in the near future as we sort of decarbonize over the the longer term. So. Um, could you, uh, you know, Bart, you just mentioned uh, infrared cameras and VOCs, but could the rest of you comment um, about the methane leakage issue and, and how your companies are, are sort of addressing it and trying to, trying to take that off the table? Yeah, maybe if I could just step in uh, to follow up on the, specifically on the, um, the infrared cameras and the methane. We've, since we started doing this um, in DJ Basin in particular, we've, you, we've had it on about 18 million components, and we've had less than 1% have shown any kind of leakage. And of those less, that less than 1%, we have uh, resolved the leak immediately. 80% of those were resolved immediately, and then the remaining 20%, the average time frame that that was resolved was within one and a half days. So it's actually been a surprise, I think, in a way, that it's actually not as big an issue as the, the, the expectation by many has been. And then I'd like to just follow up with one other thing that we're doing with many other companies. We've, we've uh, partnered with EDF and I think eight other companies on what's called the Methane Challenge. And uh, this is to, um, to really engage innovative technologies again on how can we measure, look at the volumes, and mitigate even more um, any kinds of, of uh, emissions with methane. So just two examples. Yeah, Mark, you know, first, it, it's always good to kind of start with some data. I'm an engineer, so I can't help myself. Um, you know, first of all, methane emissions in the United States, 1% comes from, I think it's actually 1.2% come from the oil and gas industry. And I think there's a perception that we create the majority of the methane, and we don't. Uh, it's also interesting to note between 2005 and, and 2012, natural gas production in this country went up 36%. Uh, and of course, you saw earlier this morning the impact that had in reducing GHGs uh, across this country. Um, what's fascinating to note is that methane emissions uh, went down 38% over that time period. So production goes up almost 40, and emissions go down almost 40. And that was largely all done by the industry itself. Um, and the point here is, is we do want to minimize our, our footprint impact. The second point is our, ourselves working with Noble and Anadarko and EDF and, and the governor of Colorado here a couple of years ago went into a program to figure out how do we actually reduce our volatile or organic components, VOCs that come off our tanks and methane. And we, so it's a little unusual, an NGO, oil and gas companies and a state get together to figure out how best to impact this problem. And, a, and what we did here I think was pretty unique. And, and one of the things that's unique about it is is it was more about direction and where you wanted to go so that we would turn loose innovation, not only in our companies, but venture capital has, has crawled into this space and said they see a business to, you know, whether it's how to identify where leaks are or whether it's about how you can control these things. And, and I think one of the things sometimes regulators miss, and it was a comment this morning about the difficulty keeping up, and Susan's made this comment in previous meetings, and, and the reality is, is they need to let technology solve the problems. Um, so set the direction, 
help us decide where we think we need to get to over what period of time, but don't prescribe how, because all you're doing is shutting down all these great minds, and actually you're, str you're shutting down competitive talents, because there will be a race to find the best solution. And that, and that actually gets us to a better place. And we do that in the regular part of our business, but we actually do it here too. And Bart had examples of that, and so did Brad, because uh, in many ways, if, if Noble does it really good, I want to do it even better. Exactly. That's the, the natural competition. So goal-based regulations as opposed to prescriptive regulations. Um, to yeah, the government just can't, right. can't keep up. Okay. Um, turning back to uh, production, um, the great success that we saw documented in the data presented uh, before lunch uh, is in a context in which the recovery factors in natural gas are maybe 25% and the recovery factors in natural gas liquids are often less than 10% and we're leaving 90% of the resource behind. So what do you see as the opportunities to actually improve these recovery factors because obviously they they make everything you do that much more economic and uh, produce more oil with uh, less wells. So uh, what's next uh, in terms of uh, innovating to improve recovery factors? Uh, let, me, let me jump on this one. The, uh, uh, we could probably talk for hours on this because there's so many different facets of our industry right now that are working on uh, enhancing recovery factors. Um, First and foremost, and one I left out this morning that Doug picked up on, is defining the optimum number of wells we can place in the formation on a horizontal basis. Uh, that is a process in almost every basin. There's still a lot of technology and a lot of uh, discovery going on. Um, that helps you, helps you place optimum number of wells and extract optimum number of minerals from those well bores. Second is in the completion design. Uh, there are probably four or five major areas going on. First and foremost are just striving for optimum frac placement uh, in a horizontal lateral. And second behind that are sand and propping designs. And, and, and uh, this morning we talked about the amount of sand that you place, uh, the rate at which you place the, the sand and the fluids. And then third is fluid engineering. Uh, there's nanotechnologies going on right now that are pretty phenomenal that uh, uh, are surfactants that can change the way uh, the oil and gas is released from the rock. That coupled with design changes and some geoscience technologies uh, and, and optimum lateral placement, all of that together when you put it in, hopefully, and these are baby steps of a formation that we may be recovering 13%. I think all the operator's goals are to take it to 14% and 15%. Someday we'd love to be able to come in and say uh, the Niobrara and the Wattenberg were over 20%. That, that's a big goal though uh, for us to get there. There are two questions I, I want to ask, one from a student and then one from uh, I think a CEO of a company that's not represented on the, on the table. So uh, um, the student is asking, and I, I'm reading her, uh, her question, Historically, in the oil and gas industry, innovation is not quick to be implemented due to the this is not always how it's been done um, attitude. Do you feel like this has changed? I, I would love to start that one. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for a long time, and um, I think the industry, through my career over 30 years, the rate of innovation and the recognition of the importance of it has accelerated almost like every year and certainly every decade. There's no doubt with the uh, onshore and conventional in the United States has changed. It's a totally different kind of innovation, which is it will impact everything uh, that we do. I think we've also done tremendous innovation offshore uh, internationally and in the Gulf of Mexico in the U.S., uh, also, there's been a tremendous pace of innovation. I do expect it will continue. Mark, if I could just Please. Please. say, I, I, think that, I think it's a fair comment because I think there's, there, you know, in our industry for a long time, you know, people used to accuse us of having, uh, you know, long knuckles that drug, don't, drug on the ground and it was just about big iron and throwing stuff around. And, and today our industry is as high tech as anything in the world. I mean, we can actually drill a well. We could start right here. We could drill seven, eight, nine thousand feet straight down. We can drill two miles sideways, and we can put it in the size of one of the stalls in the bathroom. 
that's actually better technology than they use in outer space today. And we do all that not being able to feel or touch it directly and get sensing measurements. But how did all that happens now? And I know in our company, I believe, I believe uh, innovation is a culture. It's not a process. Um, I personally spend a lot of time inside our company talking to our teams about the importance of innovating. I talk openly about the successes and the failures because we, we don't always get it right, and part of it is actually learn really quickly. We don't have it right and move on. But we believe deeply that we have to constantly challenge how we do things because there is a better way. Uh, and if you don't believe that, you will not actually win in this industry. And I think what people are starting to see is it's super exciting. It's very high tech. Digitization is coming into this industry. It's creeping in day by day. We almost don't even know it. And what it's going to do for us is incredible. We, we do, one thing we do a little differently than some is the manufacturers of drill bits today can custom design one for one whole section. Used to, you got a catalog and you picked one. Um, we actually have people come on location. We have a, a person in our company who does this, and he looks at the cuttings coming out of the well, and he looks at the wear pattern and the bit, and he works with the manufacturer to redesign in real time that drilling bit for the next well, and the next well starts three days from now. That is, uh, these kind of things are happening fast, and I, I hope whoever asked that question, I hope you actually see this industry as super exciting, very high tech super high tech and, and actually we're using it for safety. We, the rigs we use today only have about five people on them and almost all the dangerous tasks now are done by machines. And that's why the accident rate has collapsed. Used to, if you, if you worked in the, on a drilling rig, you showed up with a handful of fingers missing. You know, we never want that to happen again and, and it's actually really, really cool technology that's making this happen. One other thing to add to this. When you, when you think about the last couple of years, and I think all four of us can say two years ago at $90 oil and 350 gas, uh, it, was, it was easy to fund this also. And, but I think we're actually in a mode today that there's a different type of innovation going on because we, we literally have our engineer scientists and our operations employees, they're scratching and clawing for survival in, in a lot of cases and a lot of companies. And you see a lot of innovative ideas coming out of that. So it's almost a different dynamic of what's going on two years ago uh, and how we were attacking some things and some of the things I see happening today. And uh, so it's a different dynamic today. It, it, yeah. Could I add one more thing, too? Yeah, sure. um, this is a favorite topic. I agree completely with Doug that it's a, a culture. The innovation is a culture. And I think what we're seeing is, is companies are more purposefully in trying to be innovative, so I, as, which is one of the reasons it's growing, as well as the whole industry around, and the whole world around us is becoming more innovative all the time, and we're bringing some of those things in. I was just at a um, at a celebration literally yesterday um, that was celebrating an amazing performance in technology and science and engineering between this was in Houston between the medical industry, the energy industry, and the aeronautics, NASA, and there was a comment that was made about how we're actually starting to see the technologies that are in common and that we can use from each other into the industries. And it was an amazingly eye-opening uh, thing to see that that cross-fertilization beyond our industry with other industries coming in, of course, IT and all those analytics and big data analytics are places that are going to grow uh, a, a lot more. And then I'm going to, one more thing, and that is I think it's really important that we not forget the technologies that affordable reliable, high-density energy provides for the world. That it's not just the technologies of this industry, but it's also what we enable uh, around the world that improves all of our lives uh, around the planet. Well, it, it's not a surprise to any of you that, um, you know, that there's a, a number of questions concerning the image of the oil and gas industry um, with the public. And you, um, I think the DJ Basin story is, is a really compelling one. It's not, I don't think it's well known and, uh, and, and it could serve as an example of, of how to do things right. But, but then there's the, uh, I'll call them the big black eye incidents. And so there was one question about uh, a, a blowout at a, an explosion at an Anadarko uh, gas plant in West Texas and what, what steps have been taken to, you know, make sure things like that don't happen again. A question about the, um, the Porter Ranch, the, uh, the well in a gas storage facility in Southern California that's having a, a very serious uh, methane leakage. Um, how do you kind of maintain um, 
an emphasis on, you know, moving forward on a very broad front, understanding the importance of oil and gas to the, the global energy and economic system, improving interactions on the local scale when you operate, and preventing large-scale uh, economic, uh, economic, excuse me, environmental disasters such as the two that were mentioned in the questions. You know, we all know about the Deepwater Horizon and other similar accidents. It's, you know, you're having to deal with many different kinds of issues and, uh, and they all are very impactful in, in the mind of the public. So how do, how, do you, how do you deal with those in your respective companies? Sure, Mark, I'll start with that. And that's, there's a lot in that question. Yeah. Uh, the first thing, though, I think, is we realized that we had to tell our story. I mean, after uh, clean water and air and shelter and food, uh, you could argue that energy is right up there as one of the most important things that everybody on this planet enjoys. And uh, it's changed, it's changed um, human history and it's changed lifestyles and it's changed what we all uh, enjoy here today. And so we realized in Colorado specifically that we had to tell our story. And so Noble and Anadarko partnered uh, to um, stand up a new organization called Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development. And millions of dollars went into that, but it's an educational arm to tell that story and to, uh, to tell what we do. And I think all of these companies um, have some kind of social license to operate external engagement arms now, because we realize how important that is. I think at one time, as engineers and scientists, we thought that logic would, would prevail and we could put our heads down and do what we do and everybody would kind of get it. And we woke up and realized that not everybody is getting it. And so we have to get out there and we have to tell the story and we have to listen. And so we have, uh, we all have arms that are out in the community. Um, we have trained our employees and that's something that's distinctly different. We talked a lot about culture up here today. So we have taken our employees, thousands of employees through one to three day classes on stuff like, um, stuff like Doug mentioned, to try to dispel the rumors of how much water do we actually use in the state of Colorado. Again, less than 1% of the water in the state is used by oil and gas. To arm our employees uh, with the facts and then send them out and allow them to talk about their industry. And so I think we've made that transition from um, being uh, hiding uh, in, because we work in the oil and gas industry to actually being proud of what we do and allowing a little bit of that pride to show. Uh, we actually favor, I mean, we were talking about uh, this morning, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And so I think we lean on each other and we want, uh, we want to learn from each other and we want to raise all 5,000 EMP companies in this country to a higher standard. Uh, accidents do happen. Uh, it's the same thing. You go through a root cause analysis and you identify those and you put measures in place to uh, hopefully never allow those things to happen again. Uh, but it is... It is uh, an industry where we work with high pressure, we work with volatile fluids, and uh, you know, safety is, uh, is not low tech, it's very high tech, and safety is of the utmost importance. I, I actually think the safety record for the industry, and I don't have stats, maybe you guys do, but um, our safety record is, is greater now than it's ever been, uh, specifically for the topic we're talking about. We have technologies today uh, Doug referred to the drilling rigs. We have technologies that are, we're implementing that protect our environment and protect our employees. And, and I can assure you, all four of us wake up every day first and foremost worried about that. And uh, um, it's, it's always a challenge. It, 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 as Brad said, it's never going to go away because we're an industrial business. Uh, your, your goal every day is to minimize it. And, and I think technologies have helped do that. Um, but it doesn't take away the risk uh, that we have at times because uh, you, cannot, you cannot take the system and make it absolutely 100% perfect because we are an industrial business. And if maybe I could just elaborate a little bit more that um, it, this is a very, very important issue. Um, we at Noble, we've got a system that we call no harm, which means that we look at every aspect of what we do so that we don't harm people the environment in any way. That's that's always our intent and taking it very seriously with our, we cooperate and, and, and in work together with our suppliers, with the communities we're in. But it is, it is something that um, we have to be ever, ever vigilant. Well, we're out of time. We uh, didn't get to many of the questions. I, I apologize, but I would like to, to thank the panel and uh, hope you uh, 
have more insight into these issues than uh, you did an hour ago. So thank you very much.